the, the title of this talk is, is Holy Grail, Fairy Grail. And some of it you will know, and maybe some of it you won't, I don't know. Given that this is Glastonbury, you can never be sure. There may be people here who know more than I do about it. Um, but basically, we're going to be, I'm going to be looking at a uh, 12th century text called the Elucidation, or Elucidation, if you like, um, which was written as a kind of prequel to Chrétien de Troyes' story, Poem of the Grail, which is generally considered to be the first fully written source that tells the story of the Grail. Um, whoever wrote the Elucidation did not elucidate Chrétien at all. He made it much harder to understand by bringing in completely new elements to the story. So in fact, rather than being elucidatory, it's uh, more confusing in some ways. So um, I've known about this, this text for quite a long time, but the only translation that was available was a 19th century one by a chap called Sebastian Evans, um, and it was very badly translated and very inaccurately translated in some ways. He had the basic story, but the language was all wrong. So we looked at this, and uh, my wife, Cashlin, who is a, a French speaker, uh, started to work on it, and then we brought Gareth Knight in, and he did some more work on it, and we ended up with a new translation of the whole poem, which is now in a book which will be finally published um, early next year called The Lost Book of the Grail. We thought this was going to be a book that would only take us a few weeks, a few months to write. In fact, it took five years because the further we looked into it, the more we found. So I want to share a little bit of, of, of what we found with you and a little bit of the, of the actual text. Um, so, the story, which, as I say, uh, Yuri has conveniently pretty much uh, told you already, you'll get a bit more detail. You have to forgive me for reading this because I don't have a memory that can memorize loads and loads of poetry. I'm sorry, poetry, but it's okay here, isn't it? Um, so this is um, the beginning of the story, the beginning of the poem, because it was written in verse, not in prose. By noble command was the romance worthily begun of the most pleasing story there is, which is of the grail, of which we may not tell the secret or sing of it. For that would allow the story to grow before all was said, and many would be sorry. So the poet starts off right away by saying, we can't talk about this, but here's the story anyway. Um, and then he goes on talking about <coughs> the rich kingdom of Logres, i.e. Britain. It was turned to loss. The land was dead and deserted so that it was not worth two nuts, that they would lose from the wells the voices and the maidens that were within them. So there's a mystery straight away as to why uh, the damsels are not there anymore and why they've lost the voices of the wells. Um, and it's almost immediately then you get the story uh, that Yuri already mentioned, which is that a, a king some years before the time of Arthur, named Mangons, um, who was a bit of a bloodthirsty character, and his men became aware of the maidens of the wells. These were, as Yuri said, maidens who looked after travelers. They gave them to drink, they gave them to eat, they gave them hospitality, warmth, and comfort. And each of them possessed a golden cup. And the Mangons, greedily, decided that he would like to have one of the cups for his own, one of the cups from which he would hereafter be served every day at dinner time. So he stole the cup from one of the maidens of the wells, but it didn't stop there, as, uh, as Yuri said. Um, unfortunately, rape followed. And all his men, seeing a Mangon's example, went on and did the same thing. And the poem says, King of Mangons, who should have protected them and kept and guarded them in peace, violated one of the maidens and deflowered her against her will and took away her golden cup and carried it off with him. And his followers copied their master's example so that all the maidens of the wells were raped and their cups were stolen. And then the kingdom lost the voices of the wells and the damsels that were therein. When this terrible event happened, the voices of the, of the damsels, which we may see as perhaps um, song, perhaps prophecy, 
Um, wisdom, certainly, uh, was no longer available to be shared. And the result of this was that, in the poem, the country went into decline, and the king came to a bad end, and all the others after him, and so were many punished. The kingdom was laid waste, with no wells, nor tree in leaf, the meadows and the flowers dried up, and the brooks diminished, nor could be found from now on the court of the rich fisher. This is a very typical device of this poet. He keeps dropping clues. He doesn't tell you everything. He says, we're not going to talk about the grail, but here's a bit. And then we're going to talk about the rich fisher, but who's the rich fisher? At this point in the poem, we haven't been told. So, um, following on this, as I say, travellers who sought the hospitality of the wells were now denied them, and only a few of the damsels of the wells now served in that way, and those few invisibly. So many years pass, and the days of King Arthur dawn. When he and his round table knights heard of the rape of the damsels, they vowed to recover the wells, all swore together, to zealously guard the maidens who would come forth and the cups they carried, and to destroy the lineage of those who had done them harm. Why much remained of the wells that they no longer came out from, when they could take one, they killed or hanged him. So, basically, Arthur and his men set out on a vengeance trail. They want to kill the uh, descendants, they want to kill Amangon's men, in fact. But what happens is, they go off, in typical Arthurian Knights of the Round Table fashion, on a quest to find a Mangon's man and take revenge. But they very quickly find that they can't, because in the woods they find a group of maidens and knights wandering, and these, they learn, are the descendants of that terrible event. These are the children and the children's children of the original Knights of the Mangons and Maidens of the Wells. So they can't take revenge on them. So what are they going to do? They do find, however, that the land is waste because of the event. And then they are told that um, in order to undo this, um, they must find the Court of Joy. And if they can find the Court of Joy, then everything will be recovered and restored to normal. And um, they capture one of, the, one of the, the men who is with the maidens in this Arthurian time, whose name was Blihos Bliheris. And he was beaten by Sir Gawain because of the great prowess he had, and was sent to give himself up to King Arthur and sent to the court of which he knew nothing or of the king. But he knew very good stories that no one could be bored by on hearing them told. Thus the court asked him about the maidens who stole, who rode through the forest, and he told them then that these were indeed the descendants of them. And that it would only be, that the, the, the disaster would only be reversed when the knights and worthy men and the maidens likewise who are about in this land have to go throughout the forests and the country until it is allowed for them to be found the court from which joy will come, from which the country will be resplendent. And he adds, your adventures will come to those in the court who will seek what has never been found in this country, nor told. So the knights are given a new job. They're look, not looking for the grail this time. They're going looking for something that's never been seen before and discovering the courts of joy. And the courts of joy are mentioned in a couple of other Arthurian texts, and they're always described as a place of great mystery, a place of great wonder and wisdom. So there are some clues to the whole thing. Um, so the Round Table Knights set out on their quest, and um, apparently, uh, according mm -hmm. to the Grail stories, and this is not mentioned in any of the Grail stories, the Courts of Joy had been found seven times before. And each time they are found, a new story is told, and that story is used to cloak the meaning of the discovery. And they're called the, cloak, the Seven Cloaks of Story. And the poet goes on to list these, 
um, without telling us what they are. He just gives the names. It's a bit like if I gave you a, a list of books to read without telling you the authors, the publishers, the dates or anything. It's just the name of the story. <coughs> so, and then the story stops. It just ends. There's no conclusion immediately. But what happens next in a separate section of the poem, which seems to take another track altogether, is very interesting. Because we assume, because the story doesn't tell us exactly, that Arthur's knights do find their way to the courts of joy. But that's not the end, because at that time, as the wells begin to be reactivated, another group of people emerge from within the wells. And these are known as the knights of the rich Chaudour. And they go off onto the land and they spread rapidly across it and they build huge stone castles. And they set themselves up in opposition to Arthur. And that's where, when I was looking for a theme that would fit in with today's topic, that we came up with the idea of dragon wars because of Arthur being, Uther, uh, being the son of Uther Pendragon. That's his family name. So in a sense, these are almost a struggle that's been going on ever since these two guys um, first, um, first were first encountered in the story of Merlin. Now the maidens of the wells are very definitely of Celtic uh, lineage. It's clear that at some point um, the women of the Shi, the fairy mounds, have become incorporated into the Grail legends. And this is something that is tacit within the stories, but you don't get it spoken of because, of course, the stories are all Christianized. But certainly you can see plenty of evidence in characters like Morgan Le Fay, Lady of the Lake, and so forth. You can see that these are all fairy women in one form or another. And that's certainly very true, I think, of the, uh, of the Maidens of the Wells. So we see here a kind of, as if there's been a kind of agreement um, Kathleen came up with the, the uh, title The Fairy Accord, which is like an agreement that had happened in the long distant past between humans and fairy. And with this act of Amangons and his men, that accord is broken and the fairy beings become adversarial. And so when these characters come out of the wells in Arthur's time, they are not on Arthur's side and they are not friendly. They are against us, against the human race. Um, the unknown storyteller of the Lucidassian was a master storyteller without a doubt because he leads us on in this way. He tells us little clues and hints, little pieces of information, and then he goes off on another line and tells us something else. <coughs> um, and he brings in the whole idea of the wasteland, and then he starts talking about how in the future a knight will come who will find the grail. And this, of course, is Percival. So you can see he's inching towards the point where he, where, where Chrétien de Troyes begins his story. But we never quite get there. But he does say at the end, he who has made this book wills that you show to everyone the story of the grail and whom it served. For its services should be heard about in the right context from a good master. Let the good things which it serves become unknown and hidden, for the storyteller will teach it to all people. So here he's almost saying, let's keep it a secret between ourselves, because it will be revealed again, because the storytellers will always know the story, and that of course is absolutely true, because the story is still being told today, and I know that um, Yuri and Alan will be talking more about that later, and, telling you, and giving you their take on it all, but what excited us about this, once we got started, was the idea of, first of all, this very different cause of the wasteland, because you probably remember from the Arthurian literature that um, the usual cause of the wasteland is that a knight accidentally wounds the king who guards the grail, who then becomes the wounded king, or the fisher king, or the rich fisherman, lots of different titles. And that's where the whole story of the wasteland comes in, because a king must be perfect in body. 
if a king is damaged in any way, if he has a wound, he can't rule, and the land over which he rules becomes wasted. So here, we have the feminine idea of that. Instead of the, instead of the wounding of the king, we have the wounding of the queen, it could be said, or in this case, the maiden of the wells, um, which takes us into a very different area indeed, and connects us with the fairy people. And I think, personally, that the, the cups, particularly, obviously, the cup, first of all, stolen by Amangons, is another aspect of the grail. But it's not the grail that we're full familiar with. If we studied the legends, this is the grail of the fairy people. So it's a kind of shadow. It's a kind of echo of the usual kind of grail, the holy grail, in whatever form that comes. And it comes, as, as you will know, in many different disguises as a book, as a stone, as a cup, as a bloodline, whatever, lots of different things. Here we have another version. We have a fairy grail, which is like an echo or a mirror almost to the more familiar one. And all of this is to do with water. Yes, the wasteland becomes dry. There are no trees. The trees dry up, the water dries up, the wells dry up because of what happened. And of course, this is very important because um, the idea, not, on, not only is the obvious thing of water itself being a life-giving source, we are ourselves made of a large percentage of water, um, but in this context we're looking at a symbolic importance of, of water. Um, so for instance in the Parsifal of Wolfram von Eschenbach he says, uh, trees have their sap from water Water fecundates all things made that are called creature. We see by means of water. Water gives many a soul a splendor not to be outshone by the angels. So Wolfram's definitely seeing something very important here about water and how it becomes a, a medium by which things are transmitted and by which we understand things. Um, so we might ask, whence do these waters flow from? Um, and although many have claimed access to the Grail, no one can claim it, for it's what it contains that's more important than what it is. So, you know, you can claim it's any of the things that have been claimed over the years, and there are almost as many different kinds of Grail and different objects that have been called the Grail, including, of course, one, the, the famous Blue Bowl here in Glastonbury. Um, I've seen them all. I've managed to, manage to, to see all of them that still exist. And my feeling is that when you stand in front of it, you think, yes, this is the grail. And then as you walk away, you think, well, no, it's not the grail, it's a grail. And it's a grail because of all the people who've stood in front of it and said, this is the grail. So it has that sense of reality, but, uh, but it, goes, it goes beyond that. It goes, it's what the grail contains because it's almost always a container of some kind that is really important because it is always something that gives you access to the divine. Whatever you mean by that, for the, for the Christian writers of these stories, it was God. For the writers of the, uh, the Western world, it was pretty much the Christian God most of the time. In other parts of the world, it was Buddha. In other parts of the world, it was the gods of the Finnish people um, who had a vessel called the Sampo, which was exactly, performed exactly the same kind of uh, magical transformative energy as the Grail. So water or whatever it is that's contained, the liquid that's contained in the Grail, yes it may be the holy blood or perhaps it isn't, perhaps it's just water. It's not an accident I think that the first vessels that were made in this world were containers for water. And they weren't just made lumps of clay. If you look at the beaker things that have survived, and many of which were dug up around here, they were made beautiful because water was sacred, because it was literally the stuff of life. So therefore it's the container, the contain, what is contained within the grail that's really important. And as Wolfram says, we see by means of water it's a way of perceiving the mystery in a way that you can't without that. And even in the grail, later Grail stories, 
What is one of the names of Percival? He's called He Who Frees the Waters. So it's very important, this whole setting of the waters free, and that brings us right back to this idea of the wells. The wells are fairy wells. The well maidens are fairy women. They protect the energies of the earth, and they seek to offer only hospitality and, uh, and warmth to those who come in, in seek, search of them. Until along comes the Mangons and his men, warlike warrior types, take what we can have, get what we can, doesn't matter what happens to the women, to the fairy women. So this is a huge insult to the fairy world. And I think that if you look through the whole of the Arthurian corpus, and I've spent 40 years doing that, you find again and again and again traces of this story that there is a race of beings that are almost invisible. Sometimes they are invisible, but they're all against Arthur and his men. And Arthur and his men are not, not bad, they're not evil, they're doing their best. But they're human and they're warriors, and there's something that's bad and tainted about that. And so you get these stories. Again and again, I'm sure you can think of lots of examples of stories where a woman comes to the court of Arthur and says, I need help, give me a champion. And the champion, one of the knights at the round table, goes off with the lady, and it usually leads into the other world, or into very strange and sometimes very difficult situations where they are tested to the limit. I believe that all of these stories take us back to that same point where the fairy beings challenge Arthur and his men to show what they're made of, to show that they are more than just warriors, more than just beefcakes, that they are actually, you know, honorable people. And that, I think, is the story that lies behind this. Um, the idea of a fairy grail is in itself not entirely new. Um, I mean, if you look at the 9th century text of Pride the Anun, uh, the raid on Anuvan, the other world, you find Arthur and his men going in his ship, Fredwin, uh, to the other world, seven Kayas, um, and finding there the cauldron of Anun. And the cauldron of Anun for a long time has been recognized as, um, as a, an image, an early proto-image of the Grail, if you like. So it's all there. This whole story is there. It's simply that when you look at the elucidation, when you look at the, the story behind that, it all begins to fall into place. And it took us a long time because in the poem it says, talks about the seven cloaks of story that I mentioned. So there are seven stories that are keys, but they're not told. So we had to go in search of them. And we managed to find five. The other two are so obscure that we couldn't find any reference in any still existing text. There may have been a story going around at the time, but it certainly wasn't there by the time uh, the anonymous author of Elucidation wrote his poem in the 12th century. So this is a time when all the Grail stories are coming out. They're all beginning to be written, and most of them are being written and copied down by monks. So of course the whole thing then has the imprint of the Christian myth. But the original myth, I believe, that was still known about at the time, and which this author alone, out of all those other storytellers, managed to find another story about the Grail that hadn't been told before. And it's the story of the Maidens of the Wells, and it's the story of those that came after, and it's the story of a war that goes on in some ways. We're, we're all familiar, I think, with the idea that um, in fairy tradition there is a seely court and an unseely court, which means a sacred and a not sacred court. And the unseely ones are not friendly to us, and the seely ones are. So if you think of those ones coming out of the wells, the ones that, that are just come and spread across the land like some great corporate cloud, building castles everywhere, it sounds pretty much modern to me. Um, maybe it was a metaphor for the Normans arriving in Britain and building castles, but it still has this aspect of, perhaps war is too strong a word, but it's certainly an adversarial position that, you know, between the two, the two sides. So, um, so the Lucidation has finally begun to elucidate, I think, um, hopefully through, if we've got our, 
uh, facts right. Um, the, the book which will come out next year, The Lost Book of the Grail, little plug there, um, from Inner Traditions, will hopefully fill in all the gaps and give you a full story. And for the rest of the story, we should, I'm sure Yuri will be adding lots of good things too through his work on this. So um, that's, that's it really. I just open for questions now if you have any. <laughs> wow, I silenced you. <laughs>